Monster, Martyr, and Role Model? A review on Mary Dyer. I will be discussing the article by Anne Miles from Monster to Martyr, representing Mary Dyer. As a female in a charismatic denomination, the Assemblies of God, I am naturally drawn to women like Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer. They are women of great passion and strong religious conviction. This passion and conviction was not forced upon by a clergyman or a government, a guilty conscience, or to the submission of a husband, but through what I believe an undeniable encounter with the divine personhood of God. Historians and scholars have tried to make sense of Mary Dyer's devotion, and there are many interpretations, some of which include the question of her mental status, fantasies of supernaturalism, or a spirit of rebellion towards a patriarchal society. As noted by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich in John Winthrop's City of Women, Dyer lived during a time and culture where women were denied education and formal training in theology. Unlike Puritanism, Quakerism, the religion Dyer ascribed, ascribed to later in her life, gave great significance, honor, and validity to the thoughts and actions of both men and women. An article titled Quieting Mary Dyer by Johan Winsor states that at a time when women were generally barred from public roles, Quaker women were empowered to speak in meetings for worship, participated broadly in the ministry, and were sometimes characterized as nursing mothers of the movement. Quakerism taught the experiential and mystical relationship between the natural and supernatural, or simply put, between man and the Godhead. Therefore, such religious practices and theologies of Quakerism must have been a liberating environment that would have been hard to ignore, especially for intellectual and socially respected women like Hutchinson and Dyer. As I read Miles' article, I was struck by Dyer's persistence to visit Massachusetts on three separate occasions, especially when she knew that Quakers were banished from the colony and the consequences that ensued, which included imprisonment and for some death, which eventually included Dyer herself. Why would she continue to challenge the authority of a colony she knew would most definitely oppose her? Why not just steer clear of Massachusetts? First and most popular of opinions is that some would say that she purposely tried to create animosity with a system governed with strict, rigid religious laws for society, such as Winthrop's perfect Puritan body. A second opinion, as discussed by Miles, was that her attraction to the Quaker glorification of martyrdom led her to seal and validate the spiritual authority of her faith. Thirdly, and another narrative explained by Miles was that her allegiance to her new friends guided her bold, shameless behavior. Quoted on page 10 from Monster to Martyr, it states, Loyalties displaced conventionally gendered obligations to spouse and children in favor of bonds formed within the spiritual community. One of the reasons the Quakers were so threatening to the Puritans order was because the movement promoted and drew strength from these intense affective connections, bonds that are frequently expressed in eroticized language. But even looking at these arguments and other pieces of hard evidence, it is difficult and even perhaps unfair to commit to any supposition. Yet I would like to argue her behavior in as much as through her eyes as possible, which will be quite a challenge in this limited outlet, so I will focus on just one or two points. Again, I ask, what was so special about Massachusetts? I found a newspaper article published in 1845 that reviewed the Massachusetts persecutions. It states, in the year 1656, when the colonists of Massachusetts were complacently congratulating themselves on having established a vigorous system of uniformity in religious matters, they were very much surprised to learn that two women of the sect, which had begun to be called Quakers, arrived in Boston. There were no laws in the colony against such persons. The article continues to share the sufferings the women endured from the colony, which were imprisonment and their books burnt. The women in this article mentioned were Ma Anne Austin and Mary Fisher. Interestingly, the very people who escaped religious persecution from England were now proceeding to torment others of the differing faiths. Despite the Puritans' hostility, many Quakers flocked to Massachusetts. It seemed that persecution requires only a little spark to kindle it into a great flame. Massachusetts quickly became a mission field that needed liberation from religious intolerance and persecution.
Quaker sufferings were a testament to the sincerity of their faith and belief. So maybe Mary Dyer was acting in a purely zealous response to an undeniable and irrefutable encounter with God and Holy Spirit that convinced her otherwise to liberate mankind from religious persecution. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I want to look closer at the word witnesses in this verse. According to Strong's Greek lexicon, the word witness is literally translated as martyrs, which is where we get our word for martyr. A witness is someone who has seen or heard something firsthand. In a court of law, an eyewitness can either make or break a case. A witness has complete assurance in what they saw or heard was actual and real. There is nothing that can be said or done to deny the authentic account of another. This word analysis brings a whole new meaning to the verse in Acts chapter 1. Upon receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be witnesses or martyrs to the end of the earth undoubtedly assured of our God and of our purpose. Therefore, through the Holy Spirit, we are confident. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6 says, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. I submit that Mary Dyer's witness of God led her to great assurance that nothing or no one on this earth could ever come close to what she experienced in his presence. Her witness of God's glory led to martyrdom. In a letter before her hanging, she wrote, I have access into his presence and have found such favor in his sight as to offer up life freely for his truth and people's sake. Therefore, in the bowels of love and compassion, I beseech you to repeal all such laws as tend to this purpose and let the truth and servants of God's have free passage among you. Her actions of insubordination toward a colony was not out of intentional disrespect, but rather through the fact that she found favor in the eyes of Christ more valuable than in the eyes of men. That is a powerful statement. And to truly know our identity in Christ is the most formidable witness in heaven and on earth. When we know our identity, we are able, even in our human form, to participate and partner with Holy Spirit to bring heaven to earth. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before anything else, we must subscribe to our sonship or daughtership. We must subscribe to our identity. In order to say our father, we need to rightly understand who we are, a son or daughter who is in a joint heir with the heavenly father. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. As mentioned earlier, it is impossible to rightly interpret another person's motives or behaviors, especially when there is little primary evidence coming directly from the force. Although I, am not, although I am attracted to the life and mystery of Mary Dyer, I don't necessarily believe she is the best role model for Christians today in the face of persecution. She did say very judgmental and damning fortunes to those that disagreed with her. But nevertheless, even if only from a distance, her devout and unshakable confidence in her faith is to be respected and admired.